And I never know when it's going to happen. And I don't know how to make it stop. You think that's when Jackie takes over? I hate the name Jackie. I hate the name Jackie. The only person who calls me that is him. Gretchen Mall, everybody. The great Gretchen Mall is here. Thanks so much for being here today. Thanks for having me. Uh, congratulations here. on on the show, Chance. I've watched a few episodes. It's wonderful. You're fantastic. Thank in you. It. It's a great, great part for you. It's a cool part. That's why I wanted to do it because it's sort of got a lot of uh, well, a dual identity possibility. And um, anyway, it was just a really interesting script when I read it. So. I imagine when you're an actress starting out, or the entire time that you're an actress, one of the things that you probably always think about wanting to play is like a dual identity character. It just seems like the most fun for an actor to do. Or like 10 in one, <laughs> or like every role. I know, I think, um, I mean, yes, there's some idea that that would be fun, or to play someone who's sort of going out of their mind, all these, uh, you know, but. Then when you read the script and it's there and it's also, it's such a wonderful, it's not only a wonderful part, but it's also a wonderful world that's created. And so it was really, um, you know, needless to say, I was excited to be a part of it. Playing a character with um, dual or multiple identities, is it less or more difficult uh, to sort of make that believable? Does it make you nervous in sort of making something like that believable? Because for a viewer, it can come off potentially as... Uh, Hysterical. Yeah. <laughs> Which um, you don't do at all in the, in the show. Well, you know, I was nervous about it, and then I just realized that the approach had to be as truthful as possible, and that the the best way to approach it really was to think of them as two different characters, two different people. And the worry for me was when I might have to transition on camera between one and the other, which um, didn't happen right away. But you know, so th that was really, I think that was probably the nerve wracking part of it. But Did you go back and look at any other performances where actors did sort of multiple identities like Ed Norton in Primal Fear or? I remember like that? that really well, but I didn't go back and look at anyone because I didn't want to get stuck in a kind of way of thinking about doing it. Um, I, I read about um, people who have this disorder and and I also watched a lot of YouTube videos of, you know, so that was interesting. And, and what was kind of fascinating to me is that you don't see some crazy transformation happen in between moment. It just kind of changes no, before you. <laughs> yeah, it's not it's like, now. and then I'm gonna huff and puff and <laughs> you know, something happens. It's really, it's actually quite subtle. Yeah. And um, more important to me was to understand why this might happen to somebody, mm -hmm. you know? Because there's a lot of people out there who don't even believe in this as a real, as a possibility that people's minds actually fracture when they have so much trauma as a way of really surviving, which I think is incredibly fascinating. And it's even to the point where on the professional level, and the show kind of talks about this, there's professional disagreement in terms of when a mind can fracture like that. One doctor says to Hugh Laurie, well, she had a good childhood. It couldn't have, it can't really be the case with her because this doesn't normally happen to adults when the trauma she experienced is as an adult. Right, right. And then as the series progresses, you see more into the character and more about that. But it is, um, it, it does, you know, the, the thinking on it is that it happens to people when they're children. And I think it makes perfect sense because you really, as a child, so much of what you do is make believe and pretend. And then in order to kind of go to another place when something terrible and is happening, you can imagine how a child might be able to kind of create, and the mind can create a whole other personality, a whole other identity to go into. It goes along with when it comes to childhood behavior and, and trauma, stunted growth at the same time. When there's trauma, there's stunted growth, maybe not a sort of split personality. For lack of a better word, I'm not sure if split personality is the appropriate yeah. terminology. Well, it's changed over the years, yeah, yeah but it's, um, it, it's not really like schizophrenia anymore, yeah. multiple personalities, but it's, um, 
sort of a dissociative identity disorder. There it is. Yeah. That <laughs> seems so much, so much smarter than split personality. It's just like 15 years into the <laughs> science. Split personality sounds like I'm talking about the end of Psycho or right, something. Right. <laughs> Well, Which personality. is kind of what, you know, again, like going back to the, all of those movies, Sybil, where somebody did that, you don't, I, I was afraid to watch any of those because I didn't want to get kind of into that 50s, 1950s way of approaching this kind of disorder. Wildly dramatic way of, yeah. of telling yeah. a disorder, <laughs> disorder like this. And uh, you work with director Lenny Abramson, right? The yes. director of that Room, one movie. of the best movies uh, last from year. last year. Mm -hmm. uh, what was it like working with Lenny? Was he one of the reasons that you signed on to the project? He was. Um, I felt really safe with him, um, you know, because it's hard when you're starting a new project with a lot of really wonderful ideas, but I also felt like this is really taking big swings, you know, um, doing approaching it in a kind of noir fashion and not making it feel old-fashioned. Um, but he just... I remember talking to him on set, and his whole approach was sort of, I like to just, like, listen, step back and listen, and then it sort of almost tells me what it's going to be. And I just loved that, because um, it, it meant that he was going to let it kind of be an organic process and an organic thing. And sort of let you figure out your performance as well before stepping in and telling you what he thinks your performance should be. Exactly. And I think, uh, you know... When I read the pilot, I was really fascinated by the character, by the whole story, but really the character. And then I went to the book that Kem Nunn had written, and um, I still didn't... It wasn't like it answered all the questions. I mean, the woman is really an enigma. So I was pleased that I was also in an environment where the creators of the show seemed very happy to sort of let me fill in the blanks, and we all didn't have to know everything and be on the same page about it. It was kind of developing as we moved through it. Did you have any moments with Hugh Laurie because he's playing a doctor in this and he's so famous for playing Dr. House where you're sitting in a scene with him and he's giving you medical details and you're just going, oh, I'm in an episode of House right now. Uh, I just sort of thought, you know, buddy, you're not going to solve this one because, <laughs> you know, he's so um, famous for that role and also for being the smartest man in the room and having all the answers, you know, in that role. And um, I love this character because he's so much more vulnerable. I mean, he's really kind of a man spiraling out of control. And to sort of see him as an actor um, give over to that and, and to let himself be vulnerable in that was wonderful. He's really so talented. Yeah, this role kind of upends the sort of preconceived notion of what he should be doing following House or what he would be doing as a doctor following House. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> he has no control over this whatsoever. No control. And in fact, the more f it's more fun a ride, the more he gets completely lost and he sort of finds himself on the dark spiral down with these characters, um, mine and, and Ethan Supley's character. Did you uh, did you guys shoot on location in San Francisco? We did. It's beautiful. Oh, it's stunning. It's it, there's some there's some scenes that are, are, are capture parts of San Francisco that I love that I've I've never seen I've never seen really? a film. Yeah. I was so happy that we were shooting there um, because it's as a city it's got the same duality that I felt in a way that my character had. You know, it has this and it's. It's utterly stunning place, but then it has this very derelict um, underbelly that's just very upsetting, actually, when you, when you spend time there. It's like, how can these two things exist? And it doesn't feel like anybody's doing anything about it, and it's, it's kind of amazing. Well, yeah, the Tenderloin is one of the weirdest places I've ever been to yeah. in my life. Yes, because you think, oh, I'm, I'm, hey, I live in New York. I've seen it all, and, you know, I've seen struggling people on the street. But it's a whole other way of it, the things you will see. And it's not even, it doesn't have to be before sunrise. It doesn't have to be, Anytime you know, it's like in the middle of the day. And it's pretty, pretty tragic, really. I feel like you're stepping over people yes. in, in the Tenderloin. It's yeah. very strange. But one of the things that I do love about San Francisco, especially coming from New York, is that there feels, there seems to be a preservation of sort of like 
the old city in terms mm -hmm. of the architecture and yeah. a lot of the sort of signage that's that's still out there. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the things that I thought thought the show captured so well was that parts of the city still look and feel like the 40s and, and 50s. Yes, because things in a great York, way. we don't get that at all. <laughs> yeah, well, they're changing. Things change so fast here, and things are changing there with the tech tech world and everything. But it does still feel like there's these places and pockets that are still in another time. You still see those, like, the 70s sort of things, and it's it's really a neat place. You're uh, also in Manchester by the Sea, which is coming out next month. It is the best movie of the year. It's one of the most heartbreaking, beautiful movies I've ever seen. I'm also a massive Kenneth Lonergan fan, mm -hmm. so it was so nice to see him making this movie. Were you a fan of uh, Lonergan before jumping into this movie? Oh, yeah. I was very much a fan, and, um, and I remember reading the script and just thinking, this is gorgeous, this is so moving, and in such a kind of, I mean, it deals with, with loss, and, but in such an unsentimental way, and um, it really just had all this breathing room. I mean, it was a unique script to read, and I thought it was really special, but it also had a kind of, um, the, the characters all seemed so real, and uh, anyway, I didn't know how it, you know, how it would be executed, and we, it was very low budget and everything, but I was just so happy to have the, the small part in it that I have. Unsentimental, but I, I would still say forgiving, like beautifully forgiving, beautifully. you know? It's not like a mean unsentimental. No, and that's the thing about Kenny, is that he loves actors, and he loves all of the characters, and there's a little room for humor in there, and, you know, it's like while you're crying, there's... There's some <laughs> laughter. I mean, I loved hearing the audience at the New York Film Festival because, you know, the last 20 minutes, they were still tittering and having, you know. It's just, I think it's one of those things that brings people together in sort of the, we all experience loss and grief. It's really about grief. And, and it makes it kind of not, something you can, sort of move into and embrace as much as that um, Casey's character is not able to really get over it. I mean, that is a reassuring thing that there are some things that you cannot get over. Well, and your character in some ways represents that as well. We're not exactly sure what it is, but there is something clearly that she can't get over. Get past, yeah. yeah. And that won't change. And it's not really a happy ending, but it's it's something you recognize. She's created like extremely strict, a strict regimen around herself with this with this husband, and and that is what sort of keeps her not drunk. Right. <laughs> She's kind of white knuckling it by going towards deeply towards religion. Now, what was it like when when uh, Kenneth approached you to to be a part of this movie? I was just completely flattered. I mean, I auditioned for it and. Um, I thought it went well, and I guess he did too. So <laughs> I was really excited to just get out on set. I didn't know him prior, and we never met. I just, you know, I did it with the casting director, very kind of old-fashioned way. And it's really nice when you kind of win a part that way because then you feel super confident when you're on set that that's, you, he already saw a little bit of what he was looking for. That's so, that, I'm slightly surprised that you didn't know him beforehand because he's such a New York fixture and you're kind of a New York fixture as well. You're such a New York actress. I, when I saw you in the movie, I was kind of like, of course Gretchen Ball's in this. This is I such know, a New it's York. It's about time. This it's is such a New Yorker movie. Yeah, no, I know. Well, I, I find that, um, well, if, you, if enough time goes on, hopefully I'll get to work with all those, the great fixtures. That's my <laughs> hope. I'll just stay here in New York because the great fixtures really are great here, you know? Speaking of New York, uh, you had such a wonderful part in Boardwalk Empire, uh, which... Thank you. I, lo I love that show so much. I, I always wondered, though, for you, did you ever wonder what Terrence Winters thought of your character? Because you were so good, but your character was put through the ringer more than anybody else on that show. There were times when I was watching that show and I was like, leave Gretchen Maul alone, guys. <laughs> I think they were like, oh, she can take it. She can take anything. <laughs> but I, I think what happened really was that they made, they wrote um, these things for her to do, which were just awful, awful and hateful, and that the audience then really responded, and, and she was kind of 
a total villain. And so it became interesting for them to almost try to bring back the empathy, you know, for her, to, ma to, to make you understand that there was more there. So that came the second half of, of my time, where it was, OK, now you're going to see how awful her, this woman's life has been. And uh, in the end, I think he did find some sympathy for her, hopefully. But uh, I enjoyed it, you know? It was the more the merrier. Oh, really? Like, yeah. you're, you're the kind of, you're, you're like, just give me the meaty stuff to play with. I don't care. Yeah, well, I remember early on, I had actress friends and people saying, you know, are you sure you want to play the mom of a, like, of a guy who's, you know, 10 years younger than you, basically? And, and I just thought, but that's completely juicy. I mean, how did she get there? That is... Well, we know. Yeah. We saw in the last now season. Now you see. <laughs> yeah. I know. But, you know, it, was, it wasn't so much that, you know... It wasn't like I was meant to be older than I was. It was just it was just one of those interesting character uh, things. So there was that one great scene that I think it was in the second or third season where you got to slap a man who had just suffered from a stroke <laughs> repeatedly. The wonderful actor whose name is is escaping me. Dabney Coleman. Dabney Coleman. He is the best. He's yeah. so he's such a great character. Actor. Oh, he was wonderful. What was it like getting the chance to do that scene? That scene looked like it was. Either a lot of fun or like painstaking. He was just so time. good at acting like he'd had a stroke. It was like, <laughs> you're kidding me right now. But if you if you haven't seen it, it's like a two and a half minute scene of Gretchen oh. Muldrow beating a man who and just suffered a stroke, <laughs> deservedly so. But you know, it, there was a reason. But it was um, it was a great scene to, and I was so excited when I got that material. But I have to say that beforehand, I practiced on my own, just with a pillow, because I knew that it would be hard to kind of find that anger that she must have had really deep down. And that in that moment, he is kind of so vulnerable and she just takes her moment to go for it. And so I kind of, that was, I did feel like I had to kind of see what that was. Because I think, you know, as, as women, we're not always used to sort of expressing our, our anger or even getting in touch with it. You know, it comes out as tears or it, it comes out in other ways. And um, so it was, it was really nice to see this woman unapologetically just make somebody pay. Do you mean that in the sense that uh, women are not necessarily like allowed culturally to get as angry as men or showcase anger? Yeah, I don't even know if that's it. I just. I don't know if it's that they're not allowed. I just think that um, I see it. I have Some a sort of stigma. It's it's just it's almost a social thing that you don't even realize. I see it with I have a, a son and a daughter, so it's just an, some of it is just uh, the natural way of expressing yourself, and um, and some of it is is taught. You know, it is like oh, honey, don't you know, cry or you see that anger and you want to quiet it. It's, it's a funny thing we're all kind of collectively responsible for, I guess. But I think it's, it's a good practice to get, get that anger. Yeah. It's cathartic. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, you know, women don't go out and street fight generally. You know what I mean? I mean, it's just I not... <laughs> some do, but, you know, it's, it's just a different way of expressing ourselves. Um, how, how old are your kids now? Uh, nine and five. Nine and five. Yeah. What is, uh, how is life for you different as an actress since uh, they've sort of after the early stages of, of having children? Oh, it's, uh, it's so much better. <laughs> um, well, I don't know. It's, it continues to always be a process of finding balance, you know, um, because this profession, days are often 17 hours. If you're really working, it, is, it can be very long hours. And so the reality is how much do you want to not be around? And I think that everybody has a different kind of level that feels right to them. Or, you know, you get an opportunity and it's like, I just can't say no to that. But it takes a toll over time. You know, this was even just shooting in San Francisco. It was, you know, a lot of back and forth and then my family coming out for the summer and all of that. So you really do ask them to be a part of something. But I think they benefit from, from it as well. From, 
Well, you've always been an actress. I think even just this, you know, this morning looking over your IMDb of the of uh, since you started, you've always been a fairly selective actress, or at least it seems as such because you've done such great work over the mm -hmm. course of your career and, oh. and somewhat particular work. Do you feel like you were selective and, and particular over your work over the years? I don't know. I just think. And have you become more so since you've since since you've had kids? I'm always shocked because I don't know if this is a natural, like we all do this, but I always look and think, when did, how come they have so much stuff they do? It's, where does anybody find the time? I just feel like, I don't mean to be selective, but I, 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 am, I am unhappy when things are too out of balance. So I couldn't just like finish this job and then start up a new one. Um, and it's not that I'm saying no to tons of things. It's just that the, my natural speed is kind of to re, reassess, re-kind of connect to my life, which um, I've now, you know, having kids and everything, it just makes it more full. And you don't need the work so much for your happiness, you know. Um, but I still love it, and I still want to do it. It's just about kind of, I don't know. And I think somehow living in New York, too, you, you just take yourself out of a certain realm of, of work possibilities. You know, um, meaning that you want to shoot in New York for the most part, or I would love to, but I realize you can't always do that. We had boardwalk for four uh, or five years. That was amazing, and I knew it at the time. I knew this is like an amazing job, and it had all the elements of being a great ensemble cast, and so you didn't have to be there every day. But all the work that I did, I was super engaged in and proud of, and the writing was fantastic, and. You know, and it was in, in Brooklyn, so it was just had all the great elements for me. Mm -hmm. um, but it's hard to find those things. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. yeah. Let's open it up to the audience for questions. Who has questions? Hello. You have a question. Hello. Hello, thanks for being here. Oh. Uh, I just want to say that Rounders is like one of my favorite movies of all time. Oh. And I was wondering I was wondering how the audition process was like and how it was working with uh, Matt Damon and Edward Norton. Um Oh, that was so long ago, but that was a big deal for me at the time. It was, I think, 1996 or something, and I hadn't done a lot of movies. And, and that was I, Brian Koppelman and John Dahl, right? Yes, yeah. and, and they now have billions. Brian Koppelman has written billions, and, um, and John Dahl was directing. And Great, great noir director. Yeah, yeah, and so we... It was just, again, that process where you first you go in with, I think, the casting director and you put yourself on tape and then they look at it and then they decide to bring you back in and then all of a sudden it's time to read with Matt Damon. And, um, and he was lovely. You know, this was before, right around the time Goodwill Hunting was coming out, so he was experiencing all of that success um, and during, d while we were shooting and I just remember thinking how down to earth he was and how well he was handling all of that. And um, it was just a great time because ignorance was bliss, you know? You're kind of just working your way up the ladder and here comes another great little role in a, in a big movie with all these great actors. And so I was really excited about it, yeah. Next question. Hi. Hi. Um, I was just wondering if you maybe spoke to any psychologists in preparation for your role on Chance. I did, I did. There was one woman who had dealt with um, um, a patient who had a lot, of a lot of personalities, and she had written a book about it with the woman, and so I read the book, and I talked to her a few times, and, um, you know, and then it was pretty upsetting and pretty, you know, the, the trauma that this patient had gone through to become that fractured was awful to even read and so sad and um and then you were kind of like wow the resilience of the human spirit and the human mind the brain to be able to 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 sort of figure out a way to survive that kind of pain and awfulness you know and lack of love really it's like a child having just getting no love it's unbelievable so I did and then at a certain point I I sort of stopped those conversations because because the show isn't really about a person with multiple or dissociative identity disorder as much as it's about a man who's 
in a downward spiral and looking to just find meaning in his life, you know, by helping people, by helping this woman when he feels like the rest of his life is kind of in the shambles. So um, I just had to kind of get into that aspect of it and let it, you know, kind of trust that it was all there. The information was there and whatever they gave me in terms of the script, I was going to have to deal with that too. Yeah. I think we have time for one more question. Great shirt. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, hey, Gretchen. Hi. Um, so I got to see you uh, perform in uh, Disgrace on Broadway. Oh, uh, great. Uh, how did you get involved with that, and uh, how do you like doing theater compared to like film? And TV? I, I was so happy they called me about that. And I read the script, and I thought, oh, you don't read things like this. It was such, felt so timely about where we are as a society and how, and tribalism and how we all kind of cling to the, the thing that we know. And that's really what this play was about, it was about four different characters who all, um, you know, one is, is a Caucasian woman who comes from one background and then there was a Pakistani American man who, who's her husband and a Jewish man and a black lawyer, a black woman. And so they, you know, sit down at a dinner table and you see the interaction and you see it gets pretty sticky. And when push comes to shove, people kind of go, wait a second, I know about this. This is what I know about. This is my history. And um, it, was, it was just filled with tension and, and I was just happy to be a part of that. It was so fun to, to do it and be out, feel the audiences every night, how they would respond to it. And for the most part, they, it was upsetting, but they were sort of grateful to, that somebody was talking about it. Absolutely. Gretchen, uh, Chance premieres today on Hulu, right? Or yesterday. I it's believe, available now. It's today, October 19th? I, I think, think yesterday it. was, right? Okay, yesterday? Oh, no, maybe you're... Chance is on Hulu right now, everybody. <laughs> it is and, available. And Manchester by the Sea opens next month. Uh, in November. Congratulations on both projects. They're both incredible. Thank you so Thank much you. for being Gretchen Thanks Mall. so much for having Wonderful me. Wonderful Gretchen Mall. Thank you.